Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Marion Spencer Fay Lecture and Award Presentation. Uh, I'm Lynn Yakel. I'm director of the Institute for Women's Health and Leadership, which has been the proud home of the Marion Spencer Fay Award since 2003, which was the year after I came here. So I have had the pleasure and pride of enjoying all of our amazing honorees over the years. And we are so proud to have Dr. Wilkins here today, and you will meet her shortly. So I want to give you a very brief history of the award. The National Board for Women in Medicine was founded in 1953. And if you think back, that's well over a half century ago. And it was founded to promote and support and advance women in medicine and science at a time when there weren't many. It was made up of women leaders from across the country. And in 1963, the National Board for Women in Medicine created the Marion Spencer Fay Award and named it after the dean and president of this medical school at the time, which was Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. Dr. Fay was a trailblazer. She was a scientist and she was the head of this institution from 1946 until 1963. In the year 2003, the National Board for Women in Medicine declared mission accomplished and went out of business and dissolved. <laughs> I love this actually. How many nonprofits do you know that, <laughs> that do that? And on its 50th anniversary, which it celebrated here in Philadelphia, it turned over the award to the Institute for Women's Health and Leadership, and we've been presenting it ever since. There are th some members of the National Board for Women in Medicine who are still part of our selection committee, and I just wanna acknowledge them because they've been wonderful supporters. Dr. Nathalie Bartle, who's here, you wanna stand up? Uh, <laughs> and Jane Barth and Ruth Du Bois, who are with us virtually tonight. So we are so delighted to have them and all the selection committee. I want to thank the selection, the, the whole Mary and Spencer Fay committee, which is listed on your seat card. And it's made up of distinguished faculty members from this institution and chaired by Dr. Ramesh Ragupathy, who will introduce our speaker in just a minute. And also I wanna acknowledge Janine Barber, who is the program manager. Janine, where are you? <laughs> and Janine does a wonderful job of, of managing this program. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce my co-welcomer tonight, the Dean of our College of Medicine, who has been leading us through some changing and challenging times with a very steady hand, a great sense of humor, and a very um, collegial spirit. I'm very pleased to welcome and introduce Dr. Ch Charles Cairns. Well, thank you very much, Lynn. And first of all, thank you for your leadership. Um, talk about being a leader as we went through Vision 2020 and uh, you know now Vision Forward. Um, the, the impact of the Institute's been remarkable beyond the College of Medicine broader society. So thank you for your leadership. And thank you to everyone who came today and all of our colleagues uh, on the internet. I hopefully have some colleagues from our Reading campus here. This is really a community celebration and uh, the college is so, so welcoming uh, of our community uh, as this is one of our first in-person events. Yes, we're wearing masks. Yes, we're a little bit of social distanced, but it really is our opportunity to come together and celebrate what's so wonderful about Drexel and the impact Drexel's had on the world. What's so wonderful about Drexel? Well, we are the successor institution to the Women's Medical College, the first college for women in the world in medicine. We're also successful for Hanna Medical College, which was founded in 1848. We put these together and over 170 years of medical education has come out of Drexel. 
We also are very proud of the leadership programs. Our speaker is part of the Drexel faculty and family. She is a, a graduate of our ELAM program, the Excellence of Leadership in Academic Medicine. This is a world leading program, not just for women in academic medicine, but for all academic medicine. And so you are part of our family, Dr. Wilkins. So welcome home. And most importantly, it's a celebration. It's so wonderful to see all of our students here celebrating both the diversity, the inclusion, but the unmet challenge of health equity. We know there are challenges in our communities that COVID's highlighted. We've made a commitment to our communities and it's wonderful to see representatives and leaders from our campuses that are out in these communities, including in Reading here. We've made a commitment to integrate education, training and research into those communities across our eight regional campuses and to make a difference in the lives of those patients, those populations, and frankly, hopefully show the rest of the country, if not the world, how to do it best. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to another great leader, Ramesh Radhapathy, who's going to be introducing in more detail our extraordinarily distinguished speaker and fellow member of the Drexel family, Ramesh. Thank you, Dr. Garns. Before I introduce Dr. Wilkins, a few housekeeping issues. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Wilkins give her talk. Uh, we have uh, our live audience and we also have an audience on Zoom. Uh, so that the Zoom audience, uh, there is a request that you hold off on posing questions in the chat until the end. We will, after Dr. Wilkins uh, gives her talk, we'll go through questions from the audience, live audience here before we move to the Zoom audience and I will monitor the questions and call on you to unmute yourself. Uh, we'll place, you can see the mic in the middle of the room. So if you have questions here in the live audience, please come up to the mic and introduce yourself and ask the question. So it is my genuine, a uh, pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Consuelo Wilkins, who is a professor of medicine at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where she also is the senior vice president and senior associate dean for health equity and inclusive excellence. Uh, as, as a leader at Vanderbilt, she oversees a portfolio of programs in, that spans clinical research, education, and population health. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, and she's a nationally and internationally recognized thought leader in health equity and, pioneered, and has pioneered new approaches to engaging marginalized and socioeconomically disadvantaged populations in clinical research. Dr. Wilkins uh, completed her undergraduate uh, uh, education and then subsequently medical school at Howard University, where I'm told that she spent many a long weekend in Philadelphia while she was there, uh, and then subsequently began as a faculty member, did a residency at Duke and a fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis, where she became a faculty member, and about a few years ago moved to uh, Vanderbilt, where she currently is. She has been engaged in research from uh, in precision medicine, translational research, and health equity research for the entirety of her career. She has been continuously funded since 2003. She's published 85 papers in journals that span the spectrum of public health, social justice, and health equity, and translational science. She's currently the PI, co PI, and and co-investigator for grants worth almost $75 million and an additional 25 million as a co-investigator. Uh, and these grants are national multi-center grants uh, for excellence in precision medicine, for recruitment innovation for clinical trials and for clinical and translational research. She's been on a number of different uh, committees and task forces. A couple of those that I'll point out is the National Institute of Aging Task Force for Diversity and Scholar Development, the World Innovation Summit for Precision Medicine, and she's also a member of the 
Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute Steering Committee. She's won many awards from, uh, for example, from the AAMC, and she has served on other committees, one of which that caught my attention was that she was on the board of directors of the St. Louis Zoo. Thought that was cool. Uh, we reviewed a number of applications for this award and Dr. Wilkins rose to the top. She's being honored because of her groundbreaking accomplishments in advancing innovative, high impact health equity work, spanning research, education, and health delivery. And her pioneering approaches to engaging underrepresented populations research, her contributions to community engaged research and health equity that will positively impact health outcomes for generations. So without further ado, Dr. Wilkins. Dr. Ragapathy, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I'm deeply honored to be here to receive the Marion Spencer Fay Award. Uh, when Lynn called me months ago to tell me that I had been selected, I was really in shock uh, that, that I was chosen, really knowing the incredible list of amazing physicians and scientists who have also received this award. So, uh, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, thank you to the Dean, to the faculty, to the um, Institute for Women's Health and Leadership, to Lynn, Janine, to the selection committee, the students who were so inspiring to me this morning, uh, to all of you who have taken the time to be here. Thank you again, I am deeply grateful uh, for this opportunity. Um, I chose my the title for my uh, talk today, really um, in a way that I do much of my work and that is as a group. So I had a potential title, I took it to my team and I said, what do you think about this? Uh, and they gave me feedback and added words. And so it takes a village, came from one of the um, cardiology fellows who is a part of our team uh, we have community members who participate in our research, weekly research meetings. And so it really is a collaboration. Uh, and so I certainly think that this uh, award is uh, a reflection of the team. Uh, so when I talk about a village, I'm talking about the village of people uh, who support me at home, at work, who are uh, willing to collaborate with me and are willing to allow me to collaborate with them. Uh, you heard from uh, Dr. Ragapathy's too long introduction, sorry <laughs> about that, uh, that you know, sometimes it, it, it uh, represents uh, obviously the work that we do, but it's like now I have to live up to all that. Like that was a, he said a lot <laughs> in that introduction. Now I have to follow that. So, uh, but you know, talking about equity and engagement um, is really critical and key to all of the work that, that we do in our program. Um, I'm not sure if I needed to talk about disclosures, but um, I, I don't have any conflicts of interest with, the, um, with this presentation. I wanna start with a case though. And this really is um, in some ways representative of my <clears throat> journey to where I am today. So we have an 81 year old woman who presents with hip pain after a fall. I'm a geriatrician, so we see lots of falls. <clears throat> Excuse me. Apologies to any radiologists in the audience who think that wasn't necessary to put a, a box around the, the, fracture, <laughs> the fracture there. <clears throat> um, this 81 year old has a history of hypertension, cataracts, um, is taking two medications. She is a retired teacher, she doesn't smoke, has a few gl glasses of wine a year. She self identifies, so for the student, students who are here, I did not put that she's an African American woman in the presentation there, but in social history. 
Um, she self-identifies as a, an African-American and a woman. Um, her preferred language is English, so you can see where I'm going with some of these uh, social things and where they should be. Physical exam, she's got tenderness over her hip. It's um, her, there's some leg length discrepancy. Her uh, lower extremity is rotated externally. Uh, but again, you've already seen the, the fracture here. So she's got a fracture of the femoral uh, neck. And this is a case that I saw as a resident at Duke. Uh, so this is a black woman comes in with a hip fracture uh, and the orthopedist ran to the emergency room, whisked her off to have surgery, and she ended up on our internal medicine service. Where we did standard of care in 1996-1997 was repair the, the fracture, early mobility, control the pain, get out. Um, bisphosphonates were just, you know, really starting to come uh, to market. Um, calcium, vitamin D, those were standards of care. Uh, when this older black woman was ready to leave, I said, we didn't schedule her for a bone density scan to look at her bone density, see how much osteoporosis she had. And my team said, well, black women don't get osteoporosis. So why did she break her hip? <laughs> you know, she told us she was leaving the grocery store. She didn't get hit by anything. Uh, it wasn't a motor vehicle. She, she just fell. So it was a classic presentation for an osteoporotic fracture. But the evidence said that thin, white, and Asian women got osteoporosis. Black women did. Just so happens over the next few weeks, we saw three more older black women get admitted after a hip fracture. It might have been ICE in Durham, I don't know. But it still wasn't a traumatic you know, injury that wouldn't have happened if they didn't have osteoporosis. So that really changed my trajectory from planning to be uh, a geriatrician, taking care of the you know, older adults like the ones I grew up with in my you know, small hometown. Uh, it led me to think, where's the evidence? Who's creating it? And who's going to make sure that the people I really want to make sure get taken care of, that there's evidence to guide their treatment and that we're not gonna have these conversations that say black women don't get what they have that we just treated. So that's really how I ended up in academic medicine and doing research that I never intended to do. Also as a, uh, as a medical student, required research at Howard. Uh, I did it. I honestly wasn't that excited about it most of the time. I really wanted to be out among people. Uh, but again, th there was this pull, this call for me to, to, to try and help understand where was the evidence uh, there. So I mentioned, you know, hip fractures were um, commonly managed with surgery. Again, these were risk factors. You can see here papers there that point out that white Asian women, more likely to get osteoporosis. But this is data that we also had, that black women who had a hip fracture were 50% more likely to die after the hip fracture. So even if we were saying, oh, they don't have osteoporosis, we already knew that they were more likely to die. So what were we doing about that? We didn't have a plan to address it. Uh, so, so again, there, there's some evidence, it's not enough, but more importantly, we don't have actions to address it. What, what are the solutions to these longstanding, in many ways, intractable health disparities and, and inequities? Uh, so how are we you know, really going to address them? And that's the village and equity and engagement that I'm putting forward. So maybe my case or cases aren't enough to convince you that we need to transform uh, healthcare and research. So I'm gonna give you a few more examples. COVID-19, 
If that's not an example, I don't know what is. You've all, I'm sure, heard about the many inequities that we've seen in COVID-19. So we're seeing disparities by race, ethnicity, geography, socioeconomic status, uh, linguistic differences. So people who, who prefer to speak or whose, whose primary language is something other than English, uh, people who are, are unhoused or experiencing homelessness, um, uh, Navajo and other American Indians who are living uh, in tribal communities. So many uh, disparities and inequities we're seeing uh, due to COVID. Specifically, you can see here, this is actually updated through October 6. You can see risk of infection, so number of cases, hospitalizations and deaths. More common among uh, American Indian, Alaska Natives, Black, African American, Hispanic, um, uh, Latino populations, Latinx populations. We've known this since four weeks into the pandemic, we were seeing these data. We were hearing about it in China, that people who are living in rural communities were more likely to be impact, infected, more likely to, be, um, to experience death. So this, this isn't new. We didn't just learn about this last month. We've known this for a long time. We knew this well before the first vaccine was authorized for emergency use. Yet these populations that are more impacted by COVID are less likely to be vaccinated, right? So we see here the lowest vaccination rates, African-Americans, 48%, Hispanic, Latino populations, 53% the most impacted populations, the least likely to be vaccinated. So we sometimes try to convince ourselves, oh, it's them, they did, we put it there, they didn't take it, We're, you know, we made it available, it was easy. Um, I think a common mistake we make though is, what are our goals? right to left thinking. I'm always talking about that. My team is tired of hearing me say it. But what are our goals? Are our goals to make sure that we address these disparities and inequities? And if so, if we're not reaching those goals, why didn't we change the plans earlier? You know, we come up with these great plans and then we say, let's just see what happens. But we know what's happening and we didn't change it and we didn't fix it. So we intervene way too late. Another example, precision medicine, you heard in my bio that we're doing work in this area. A big part of precision medicine is genomics. Uh, and this is an area where we have been highly dependent on existing data, existing databases. So this is, uh, many of you may have already seen this before. It's shown a lot that 2009 and 2009, the um, more than almost 2 million samples that we had that we could do uh, genomic studies on, 96% were from people of European ancestry. 2016, we're doing a little bit better, 81% European ancestry. So we're um, increasing the number of people who are non-European ancestry. Much of that increase has been and populations of Asian descent. Still very few people, African, Latinx, Hispanic, American Indian. Well, that, that can be tricky. We can talk about that if you have a question uh, with the lack of trustworthiness they have and uh, their willingness to actually um, donate or participate in research. What sense does that make that we have 86%, 96%, 81% of the databases, the genomic samples available being of European ancestry when this is what our world population looks like. Now, this is not ancestry, but most of the people who are living in Asia and Africa are people of Asian and African descent or recent. 
So 60% of the world's population, people of Asian descent. Asia is a huge continent, lots of different populations, cultures there. Africa is a big continent, also lots of diversity, uh, different populations, ethnicities within that African continent, 17%. So that's 77% of the world's population, these two continents. But we have 81% of the genomic samples, people of European ancestry. What is it gonna look like in 2050? Only getting, only increasing. So we're gonna have 80% of the world's population in Asia and Africa. And look at the, at the top there, look at the change and the percentage of the world population, 22%, 9.6. And then 2050, we're expecting Europe to represent you know, 20, 7% of the population. Again, lots of diversity in Europe and, the, and North America as well. So are we preparing for discoveries that really are relevant to the entire population, to the world population? Are we preparing for discoveries that are relevant to um, a minority of the population. One more example, which is an area that I've been very involved in um, since the beginning of my research career. So, so let me connect this. I was interested in Alzheimer's, I was interested in osteoporosis and I actually tried to do a study as a resident where I was gonna enroll these people in um, a, a small study, observational study. And I, as I was going to try and consent them for the study, they were confused. Uh, not uncommon older adults to have, you know, confusion, delirium in the hospital. Uh, so next step, we'll just do follow-up memory problems noted there. So then we started, then I started becoming interested in this intersection between cognitive impairment and physical impairment. So that's how I got into Alzheimer's disease and, and looking at these disparities. So we have known for a long time that disparities among African-Americans and, and Hispanic Latino populations exist as it relates to Alzheimer's disease. You can see the numbers here, 1.5 to two times more likely may have something to do with cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular risk, uh, which can increase your risk of, of Alzheimer's disease. There are, there's a lot of concern and interest in Alzheimer's disease because the population is aging. Your, light, your risk of Alzheimer's increases as you age. And so we're very concerned that in 2050, population demographics are changing, but also the burden of Alzheimer's disease, the cost, uh, those are huge concerns. So a lot of interest in, the, um, in drugs, drug therapy to treat Alzheimer's disease. This image that you're seeing is 59% of the drugs in the pipeline, this is as of 2020, uh, are actually disease modifying drugs, which is very exciting because you know, the drugs that we have available had before this year, we're primarily focused on symptoms. So can we have drugs that are actually targeting the proteins, amyloid, tau, that are more commonly seen in Alzheimer's disease, so the path, uh, pathognomonic of the disease. So we have these amyloid, um, anti-amyloid agents are the largest group here. You see that six here. So this is again, um, data from February, 2020. Well, what happened this year? In June of this year, the FDA approved an Alzheimer's drug uh, that was the first Alzheimer's drug approved in nearly 20 years. So anti-amyloid drug, lots of initial excitement, sort of. <laughs> Some of you know about this, uh, uh, this drug. Uh, so aducanumab was FDA approved Lots of debate about whether or not uh, it works. Relatively small sample size for, for a study for some drug that's this, that's this important. But let's look at who 
participated in the clinical trial that got this drug approved. I just told you, African-Americans, Hispanic, Latino uh, people more likely to get Alzheimer's disease. So 3% of the participants in that study were Hispanic, less than a percent black. So we have a drug coming to market in the United States where we know there are disparities in this disease and less than 5% of the study population represents these populations. Drug also costs $56,000 a year, right? So $56,000 a year. So who can afford it? Even if you have um, insurance with a small copay, it's, if it's any percentage of $56,000, it's pretty expensive, right? So again, I would say overall, we have a lot of work to do uh, as it comes to, in, in terms of both our healthcare delivery as well as the kind of biomedical research um, that we're doing. Now, I wanted to, to share you know, um, examples of the incredible work that uh, the teams I work with are doing as it relates to engagement and equity um, and this idea of a village. Uh, and I had a tough time deciding what to share in this short period of time. Uh, so I'm trying to connect these themes, but if it doesn't seem as connected to you as it seems to me, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, so what do I mean with engagement? So some of the students, when we talked this morning, we talked a little bit about engagement. And I think uh, it, there are really a couple of concepts that are very important when I talk about engagement. And that engagement, number one, is not recruitment. So if your only reason for talking to people in a community is to get them to, pers to participate in your study, that is not engagement. That is perhaps good recruitment, but it is not engagement. Engagement is bi-directional. That means there is some communication back and forth. It's not unidirectional, it's not outreach, it's not education. You're not just going out telling people something. You are learning something. You are gaining knowledge. You are getting information that then is used somehow to change what you do. So a marker of engagement is, did something change? If nothing changed, it's not engagement. It could have just been, it changed how you thought about it, how you wanted, how you um, perceived um, the outcomes. That's a potential change, but ideally we wanna see more. We wanna see something in the approach, the strategy, more outcomes that are uh, relevant to the community. Um, you you want to include something that really is evidence that you heard them and you did something differently. Otherwise, you're, it's just performative. You're just going out to say you went out. The primary reason you want to uh, engage communities uh, there's no substitute for the lived experience. Um, if you are a diabetes researcher and you spent your entire life doing diabetes research, but you have not had diabetes, you've not lived with someone who has diabetes, you have no idea what it is like to take the drug, to give yourself injections, to follow the diet, you have no idea what it's like unless you get that input from somewhere. So this is really critical in the implementation of what you're going to do. Uh, so if, if you've already got it figured out by the time you go to the community again to implement it, this is why we're having so many failures because we didn't get input about the process uh, early on. So this is a continuum of, of engagement 
uh, that our team developed a few years ago to help guide researchers in how to engage. Uh, and it's really intended to give you some um, tools. So in that lighter on the, on the far left side, on the left side, gives you some types of engagement that you might do. Uh, and we don't have a time, time to go into to these really in detail, but um, the, a couple of things I'll point out here, the, these advisory groups here, this is the most common way that we see uh, communities being engaged in research and education, but often it's still very performative. So if you invite your community uh, advisory board in and do a song and dance, a show, a presentation, and you didn't ask them any questions, you didn't ask them to weigh in on anything, you didn't give them the opportunity to critique it, you didn't get feedback on it, that was not engagement. You're just checking boxes again. Um, we actually have multiple projects though where we have engagement at all of these levels. So one question I get a lot is, now which of these is the best? All of them, right? So it depends on what you need. And really, if you're, you're doing engagement well, you have people um, in, in, in all of these areas. So what is health equity? Um, Checking the time, make sure we get through these. Equity and health equity is important to think about fairness and justice. So does everyone have a fair and just opportunity to be healthy? Uh, this, there are multiple definitions for health equity. This is one from the World Health Organization. I like it because it, it focuses on avoidable, unfair, and it includes you know, these socially, economically, demographically, geographically uh, defined uh, communities. Many of you have seen this image before. It's from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, equality is not equity. Giving everybody the same thing doesn't work. You have to give people what they need. And this, for us as physicians, I will say is really challenging. When I talk to my colleagues, sometimes they say, I treat everybody the same. Well, does that make sense? I often will give an example. Do you have children? Do you have more than one child? Do they, do you treat them the same or do you give them what they need? Because they have different needs. If siblings, everybody, you can find an example somewhere. If you give everybody the same thing, it's not going to work. So why do we think it works in health? And why do we think it works uh, for public health and other outcomes? There, there has to be some way for us to consider what people need so that they actually have the opportunity to be healthy. Now here's where we get to the village part. So I talked about engagement, talked about equity. I talked, now here's the village. Health inequities are some of the most complex problems we will ever see. It is nearly impossible to make any progress if we stay in silos. Uh, so, so we have to embrace this approach that we're going to work with other groups of people. And here is this continuum of what, what some people would call disciplinary integration. Uh, so moving from disciplinary to multi multidisciplinary, okay, you got more than one discipline, but you may not be working together. You just, we got one grant, you get your money, you get your money, and we'll meet up at the end and put the report together. Interdisciplinary, there is some interaction. There's more of an effort, but not quite, you know, leaving our silos. We're still very comfortable in our own approach. And transdisciplinary, though, we're really moving beyond these boundaries. We're transcending, you know, our silos and coming up with new and different ways of thinking about uh, how to address these issues. Uh, and so that is a lot of what our work has been, spending this time to think about who else should be at the table if we're going to solve these problems. Who else is needed? What other viewpoint 
do we need because what we're doing isn't working. We've added to this, uh, and Harry Selker up at Tufts and I you know, published a paper a few, year, few years ago on this broadly engaged team science. And so this is adding in now to that transdisciplinary work, the, the, um, the community or the individual uh, perspective, people with the lived experience uh, perspective. So, so the village includes all of these people, the disciplines, the people who are needed to, to solve those problems. So I wanna give you a few examples. So we talked about COVID and some of these inequities earlier. Uh, in Nashville, um, very early on in the pandemic, our dean and CEO asked me to join the COVID command center and put together a team, uh, a health equity team focused on, on this. And so uh, one of the first things we did was, was what's the data look like? Um, we needed to disaggregate the data by race, ethnicity, and language. Many of you are aware that there were a lot of issues with the data not being collected early on. Um, at Vanderbilt, we actually do quite well with uh, collecting language data. Uh, we have some work to do with collecting all of our race, ethnicity data, but we're doing quite well with collecting uh, language data. So um, one day I'm in my office in April, 2020, uh, and we identify the, the zip codes that, that have the highest um, uh, number of COVID cases at Vanderbilt. That, that, at that time, we just had the Vanderbilt uh, data, but we initially were the only site in town that uh, was actually doing COVID testing. Uh, the the, the COVID-19 cases were in a zip code in Southeast Nashville that ha had one of the highest uh, percentages of uh, recent immigrants, uh, families who speak languages other than English. Uh, and uh, these are the demographics you can see here, um, comparing them to others in the population. Now, uh, as I realized this, that people, we had this huge disparity among people who spoke languages other than English, uh, you might imagine that that language was going to, the, the, the language most represented there was going to be Spanish. It was not. Anybody want to guess what it was? Stay here. Creole? No. Nepali. We actually have a relatively small popula a Nepali population in Nashville. Um, and uh, this happened to be a group of people who uh, were very hesitant to come in to be tested. Uh, they are a close community. Um, and we were just shocked there. Close behind was Arabic, which is not as surprising because that's the third most commonly spoken language in, in Nashville. Uh, so uh, I'm sitting on my floor at this point, just trying to think about what to do with this information. I've got to call the state health department. I've got to call the local county health department and tell them this and, and share this information because they're putting together teams of contact tracers, none of whom speak Arabic or Nepali. Uh, you know, they've got English and Spanish, really doing a great job of identifying people who are, who are bilingual in Spanish. But we've got this population of people that the Nepali community is actually relatively hidden there. Um, the community health center that we ended up working with who see, you know, has a fair number of um, Nepali patients, you know, basically had to do home visits to try and convince them to be tested. They're also concerned about jobs. They're working in service roles. They're working in meat packing plants. These are people who are actually more likely to be employed than other groups, but making less money. Um, so, so these are things that we had to pull in with these social determinants of health to try and understand. So, you know, we created this dashboard and this is a paper we published earlier this year 
uh, describing this, um, this health equity work stream. Um, we, in addition to testing, uh, care, we had a work stream that also focused on research. So at the time, when there's no proven effective treatment for COVID-19, it's more important now than ever to have diversity in these clinical trials. So we had a research focus. The other area we had was uh, telehealth. So we presumed that with everything shifting to virtual, that there would be some um, disparities in adoption of telehealth. And we wanted to be proactive there. So that's, again, the right to left thinking, right? So we're like, what, what do we want to prevent? What do we want these outcomes to be? And how do we address them? So um, here, this is more from the, uh, from the paper um, that's, that's really, again, comparing that zip code I mentioned to the national population. This is, this is really important because out of context, you might say, oh, 16% of the population being Hispanic, Latino, that's average, not in Nashville, not, not in Nashville. So knowing that, that there are differences in, in these groups, really very important. Again, I mentioned working with some communities. Um, Salome is a community health center that I talked about um, who, who had a relationship with the Nepali community. We had um, community organizations that we partnered with who hosted town halls in Arabic and Spanish. Um, and we wanted to recognize them as assets. So that's the other thing that we see often. People are going into communities uh, and they're you having this deficit mindset that you know communities just need charity. Uh, and we're here with all of our knowledge and resources to impart upon them and not realizing uh, the assets in these communities are needed if we're going to actually uh, address these, these issues. These are the people who know most about the communities, what's gonna work, what's not gonna work. So we gave them information, we made sure that it was vetted and, and uh, accurate, trusted information, and we supported them in disseminating it. I talked about precision medicine genomics and this lack of, of um, diversity in genomic samples. Uh, so uh, I've had the privilege now of working with the All of Us Research Program. It's uh, really the centerpiece of the NIH's uh, precision medicine initiative. It is, is planned to enroll a million people, have genomic data, electronic health records, physical exam data, lab data, um, be a platform for research. So for those of you, especially students who are not familiar, you any of you can be researchers and use the data here. You can go find out more about how to get access to the data, get approved to, to do research. It's an incredible resource. So all of us now, this is data as of yesterday, um, has more than 425,000 people who have signed up. Now, we say we're going to have a program with a million people, and you, know, you just convince yourself this is possible. <laughs> uh, we're, we're really excited that it's actually happening. So four years in, now we have more than 400 people, more, four, more than 400,000 people, more than 300,000 have completed all of the initial steps. That means they have um, signed up, they've completed their initial surveys, uh, they've given us access to records, uh, all of the things required for the full enrollment these people have done. Now, less than half of the people in all of us are white. When we started this program saying we're gonna have diversity, it needed to be intentional. We need to have strategies in place to ensure that we're in community health centers, we have trusted individuals who are part of the research teams, that we have uh, the abil ability to participate fully in Spanish, that we have all sorts of resources to support that, um, that work. 
Well, now, how did that happen? Um, at Vanderbilt, we have, uh, and, and along with uh, colleagues at Meharry, created um, uh, an approach called Community Engagement Studios. So we bring community members to the table to give input on specific projects. It's not a community advisory board because it's different. So if you're doing studying cardi cardiology, if you're doing a traumatic brain injury study, we're bringing those people to the table to give you input. It's very selected based on, on the, um, the study. And they give you specific input based on their lived experience. So we have been doing this now for years. We have lots of publications. We have PCORI funded projects. We've taught people, I think we're over 20 now, um, institutions that have adopted this model and are using this uh, in their work. We use community engagement studios um, to, to get input into our precision medicine initiative. So these were the initial populations that we, we actually um, started with. So as someone who has done clinical research um, and community engagement, equity research, I'm kind of used to people saying no to me and I have to like convince them. So I went with this list of all of these groups of people that I needed to do community engagement studios with. And I just expected that somebody was gonna try to talk me out of it and say that's too many. Well, they didn't. <laughs> so so uh, we went around the country doing community engagement studios with these populations. Uh, we were in uh, basements and churches on the south side of Chicago. We were working with the deaf community in Rochester. We we're in um, uh, Koreatown in LA. We we're all over the country, um, South Dakota, we, we were trying to get input from these people to help inform the program. And I think that's really critical to the diversity that we now have in the program. We also continue to engage communities. So we have in those, remember that continuum, we have people who are serving on the steering committee, executive committee, they're side by side with NIH, uh, investigators and leaders and PIs all over the country. These are people who we, my team has to get from wherever they live to Bethesda to be in person meeting with um, individuals uh, in the program. Now, that's no small feat uh, because we have people with varying socioeconomic resources. We need to pay in advance. We need to, uh, some of them, uh, require caregivers to travel with them. So a lot of work goes into that. And then the last minute or so, as far as um, the examples, you know, we have created a lot of resources to support uh, recruitment, mi minority recruitment into clinical trials. Uh, I talked about Alzheimer's disease. I'm currently involved in a national study where we are doing um, amyloid PET imaging to look and see if people have this protein that's most common, the most common protein associated with Alzheimer's disease. A study that was done originally, more than 18,000 people, less than 10% were racial and ethnic minorities. So again, it's the, where are people? So in this new study, we are recruiting 4,000 people, 2,000 African-Americans, 2,000 Hispanic, Latino, older adults. Uh, and we are being intentional, looking at the barriers at every level. Uh, including at the scientist level, which is sometimes what we what we want to dismiss. And then we have study specific barriers such as, you know, we're talking about PET imaging, which has radiation uh, and the fear there and the conversations we have to have. So we're creating these materials with communities. Uh, we're for for the for the uh, Spanish speaking community, we're using a trans creation process. So we're not just creating the recruitment materials in English and then translating them. We're taking the message to the community and saying, how would you want this communicated to you? And then we're creating those materials in Spanish uh, so that, it's, that, that it makes more sense to them. So um, uh, in the process, we're trying to support the teams. We have a mass online course 
uh, that focuses on minority recruitment. It's free. If any of you are interested as on Coursera, you have to, you'll be forced to see me in, in, this, uh, in this course and others on my team. Uh, but it really talks about some of these barriers there. Um, and then lastly, just with the teams, I know many of you have been involved in efforts in the last 18 months, 20 months, focused on racial equity. I had the pleasure of working with an amazing group of people. More than 100 folks came together as our, in our racial equity task force uh, to come up with plans, come up with recommendations in eight areas. And uh, we just recently published this in Academic Medicine so you can read more about it. But these are the kinds of, of groups that have to come together uh, if we're going to affect change. In that group, we had campus police, we had a quarter of the group students, we had um, faculty, staff, we had people who are working in environmental services. Uh, so, so those are the people, uh, unfortunately, who are most impacted by these inequities. And so we had to make sure that their voices were represented. So I hope I've given you a sense of some of the work that we do in these different areas. Uh, and then just to recognize uh, many of the people, not everybody who's been involved with these studies is represented here, but these are some of the people uh, in my village and with whom uh, I share this uh, amazing award. Thank you. So if any questions, please come up to the mic and introduce yourself and ask questions. Hi, my name is Chuck Aaron, and I have the privilege and honor, right, to, to be Dean here. And, and thank you, first of all, for an extraordinary talk. Uh, it not only reflects the contemporary issues that we need to address, in academic medicine, but frankly, that's what society needs to address, both in this country and around the world. Uh, and, and it also highlights your extraordinary track record, uh, and you are so most worthy of this award, and we're so honored to have you here. You. you know, one of the challenges uh, that I see is in that data on the clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. You clearly have made a compelling case that we need to increase the diversity of our populations. We have to engage people and we have to engage them at their cultural level. Yet here we have a company that no doubt invested a lot of money. How do we align this kind of value proposition between those making these discoveries, developing these new technologies, even these new care models, and meeting the needs uh, of the populations in a more inclusive way? Yeah. Thank you again, Dean, for the opportunity to be here and for the kind re remarks. Um, I think we have more opportunity uh, to impact drug discovery when it's NIH funded than industry funded. And so I think starting with NIH, where we already have expectations for diversity in enrollment, but we submit these enrollment forms and sheets and tables. And when we don't meet the, and, and we, we say whatever we need to say to get that money to get the grant funded. And then when we don't meet those accrual goals, no one holds us accountable. So we have to have some accountability um, being held by the funder. I mean, it would be ideal to say all of us researchers are going to you know, make sure that we get our, our uh, accrual goals, but you know, it's not happening. We're going to have to have uh, the funds withheld. Uh, maybe the IRB has a role in that. I know the IRB folks push back on that, but I think we have to have some accountability uh, there. Uh, with industry, it's really amazing with this particular company uh, that they didn't have much diversity there, but after the drug was approved, I was driving, I was leaving my office one day, I'm in the car, I'm listening to uh, R&B station, and I hear this incredible commercial asking so thoughtfully, is your loved one suffering from memory problems? It's like explaining it. It could be Alzheimer's disease. And it gives a very easy to remember website for me to go look up. 
and it's the company's website. So they can get you, if you go to this website, you, they can refer you to um, a, a dementia specialist who knows how to order the PET scan and all of those things. If they could do that after the drug <laughs> was approved, they could have done that before. I mean, it was really one of the most amazing commercials. I was like, wow, we, we need those people. I mean, they have the money that we don't have in academia for this kind of marketing. But but they could they could do that. They knew to go to the radio. So I, I think there's there's no accountability. So the FDA really needs to set that expectation. That's are they I was going to go approve? To. Yeah. Where, where, is the FDA going to say no no no? Where where are the people who are most impacted by the disease? And and so I, I think that's how how we have some standards and expectations set there. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Wilson, do I need to get right there? Not here. I, I can hear you. You can hear me. Uh, thank yeah, I you. Got you. I think oh, actually, you don't have, you know, there's yeah. people on Zoom that might want to be able yeah. to. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> thank you for the excellent presentation. And I just wondered if you could comment, Dr. Wilkins, on when, uh, when and how. Uh, should we start teaching some of these strategies that you have uh, talked about in terms of community engagement and research to our medical students, residents, even in fellowship? What is your uh, thinking on that in terms of the training when that should begin? Uh, I, I think it should begin, uh, it should be foundational. Uh, it should be foundational in communicating uh, with uh, patients, families, communicating your research effectively. I mean, I, all of these are tied into engagement. Uh, but but I'm, I, I think one problem is actually we need to stop telling them to, to not engage. A lot of our students actually come to medical school, they come to graduate school, they have experience. I mean, we're looking for it on their uh, application. Like, where is your community service? What are you doing? And then we get them into our ivory towers and we say, you don't need that. You don't need to talk to people. All of the knowledge, the brilliance is here. So stop doing that. I, I think that it's actually more intuitive for, for people to engage. Now, for some people it might be challenging we have, with our community engagement studios, we have a model that takes the burden off people and connecting. Uh, and, and so there are those strategies. So we, we need more resources, we need more infrastructure, but I think it has to be, you know, day one, we're doing more programs already where students hit the door and they're going out into the community. They're learning about social terms of health. I think it all needs to be tied in. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Wilkins. Um, so from a scholarly point of view, I'd love to hear your comment um, on uh, clinicaltrials.gov, where a lot of us scholarly researchers go to to look uh, to do or uh, collect data for disparity research. And you know, we do find that a lot of clinical trials are not reporting race and ethnicity data. And therefore, you know, it's kind of, you know, an antithesis to what you're trying to do in terms of helping to instruct, you know, healthcare medicine. So I'd love to hear your comment on yeah, what I'm, could be done. Yeah. To I mean, I think it goes back to NIH, FDA as well. So um, NIH dollars are our dollars. There's public money and there has to be some accountability. So if we're funding these research studies, um, it, it should be an expectation. I mean, there are already guidelines set that you have to, Register at clinicaltrials.gov. You're supposed to report your enrollment data, and no one follows up to see if you do that. Now, there are lots of other challenges with clinicaltrials.gov, right? So there, there's studies from all over the world there. There are a lot of studies. If you go just even to search for COVID-19, there's studies listed that aren't even really clinical trials. So, you know, who's managing that? What's the what are what are the resources needed? Uh, but but I think it gets back to the um, are the funders going to take the responsibility of holding people accountable? Is FDA as uh, the organization that is overseeing, especially drugs, 
going to take some responsibility there. I, I think that's, that's an important piece. Now, we could also talk about whether or not NIH should be sharing those enrollment table data mm -hmm. that, you know, why, why they have it, you know, is it a secret? Why can't it be, you know, made public? Um, and, and so I think there's some other strategies there. Thank you. Just to add to that too, I mean, the, the other aspect of it is in, ter in terms of reporting data in, a, in these from clinical trials or even from, uh, you know, patient data, journals are not necessarily at this point requiring that. I mean, I think that should be a, that needs to be also out there that, you know, if you're going to report patient data that uh, race and ethnicity should be part of the reporting, not just age and gender, which is what it is right now. Absolutely agree. Maybe the, maybe the research will pay more attention to the when they don't get their papers published. Uh, we do have, I think, one question from uh, uh, from the Zoom. Uh, Alicia Fair, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question uh, of Dr. Wilkins, please go ahead. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Wilkins. I'm also corresponding with some of the stakeholders that are on the Zoom that are pumped up by your talk. But I've worked with you a while, full disclosure to everyone listening, and I've had my experiences working alongside of you and, and seeing the transformation in person. So sometimes engagement takes a while. There's trust, there's rapport that must be built. But is there a time that something happened in the room that you saw a community member or a patient working with an engagement in an engagement approach with a research scientist and the light came on for them? I really would like to know yeah. your perspective yeah. on that. Hi, Alicia. Uh, Alicia is part of the wheel. Hello. The, the Wilkins Health Equity and Engagement Lab. Um, so it happens a lot that the light bulb goes off. Um, and in particular in these community engagement studios. So. I can tell a researcher over and over, you know, you, you, that doesn't work, you need to do it. But when I, when I can bring people to the table um, who are from these communities or have a specific disease, and they can sit in front of a researcher and say, I'm not gonna be able to participate in your lung cancer screening study because I have to work all day. And all of your appointments are between eight and five. I would love, because lung cancer runs in my family. I would love to do that, but you're not giving me an opportunity to do that. Or if you have these appointments on the weekend, but the bus doesn't run on the weekend, at least at the same frequency, you need to have resources for the cab or vouchers for the cab. Like that sticks with them a lot more. Those light bulbs, those aha moments, and I think it's the, you know, we do a lot to try and balance the power in the room, but there's something about that experience that allows them to really hear what people are saying. So we actually see it a lot. And I think it's um, revelational for, for people to, to have that experience. Good evening, my name is Dr. Annette Gadebeku. I'm faculty in the family medicine department here, and I just wanna thank you so much for your talk. It was an excellent presentation. My question for you pushes the earlier question a little bit further. As someone who has been teaching community engagement for the last 12 years, um, you have a room full of awesome students who are thirsty for this, especially after not being able to engage um, with COVID-19. Our biggest challenge is not that we tell our students not to engage, but we don't have the support, um, especially as faculty, to do it, um, to teach it, to go out and live it. Um, and I just want to hear your recommendations for an academic institution to incentivize and not be a part of volunteerism mm -hmm. for their faculty, but to actually support everyone in going because these are the next leaders in doing what you're doing and we need to start teaching them as soon as possible but we often don't have the support the time the effort to do so yeah thank you uh, you know the double amc recently came out with a position um, to have community engagement be the fourth mission and 
Um, I think it's really important that medical schools pay attention to that, be willing to adopt it, understand the resources required, but also reward it. So, you know, colleagues like you around the country who are really dedicated to doing this uh, are often having to do it on the side in addition to everything else. And then it's not considered in tenure and promotion. Um, there are no additional resources provided. Um, there, there are all of these disincentives, actually. You know, we have department chairs who will tell you, don't go into the community because it's taking away from your writing and, you know, publishing. So if we, if we understand, though, that the value of engagement is priceless because it can lead to increased trust or increased trustworthiness that we as an institution are more trustworthy, that's tied to everything. That's tied to research, that's tied to education, that's tied to, tied to clinical, it's tied to the endowment, it's tied to everything, but it's hard to quantify. Uh, so we have to have our leaders really accept that this is valuable, recognize that it takes time, and put in the resources to make it happen. And I think there's some great examples of institutions uh, that are doing it. You know, if you look at the AAMC's um, awards, focus on community engagement, there's some really stellar programs that are doing it, but it requires a commitment. Um, and I, I think, you know, if we could do dollar for dollar community engagement for MRI scans, PET scans, you know, um, freezers for all of the assays, it's much less expensive to do community engagement than, than to do all of the other things we do, but we somehow seem unwilling to, to invest in it. And I think that's the lack of recognition of the value. So we have to push for that. Thank you so much. Dr. McQuarrie. Uh, good evening. Uh, Leon McCray, Senior Associate Dean of the University here. Let me pull this down so I can talk into the mic. Uh, and also a family doc. So I'm really um, curious about the idea of how you figure out how to better recruit patients and diverse patients. So we know all about the importance of um, concordance between provider and patient and how that can influence behaviors. Um, and I've been a primary doc in the community for a long time. Um, and yet opportunities for researchers to come into my space and ask me, you know, do you have patients who are interested in this um, has never happened. Mm. Um, and so I guess my question is, what novel things have you done in your space? Um, and or, you know, how do we address that as another vehicle to make sure that we actually increase recruitment from diverse spaces? We're all the researchers who are hearing this message, right? That we have a physician who is likely seeing a more diverse population than average, and no one has approached him. A big flaw in how we think about uh, recruitment in general is that we actually base uh, you know, these protocols almost on ordering mice. It's like, you know, we wrote the protocol, we did everything, and when it's time to do the study, we'll just order the mice and they'll show up. You know, and, and so for the clinical trials, we're like, okay, we're ready. Everybody come on in. And then we're like, well, no, no one's here. Did, did you do the environmental scan? We're even now using EHR data to say, hey, we have this many, you know, minority patients who come here, but you didn't stop to think where they're going in the health system, who they're seeing. You didn't contact them to say, would you be a part of the study? Um, do you think it's feasible? All of those steps are missing because we just somehow think that recruitment is going to happen and we didn't plan for it. So I, I, think, I think some of the steps are really simple. Like, do you really know where people are in the system? And have you talked, it's about engagement, have you talked to the people who are where they are to understand what those barriers are to recruitment. Well, this, um, the Alzheimer's, the PET study that you know, we talked to some of the, the practices who were involved in the first study. 
and said, you know, what did, what happened when you try to recruit um, minorities? They told us people were scared about the PET scan, the injection, the radiation. Um, they talked about the copay, the issues. They talked about the additional time that it was going to take them to go through the consent form with them that minorities might have an adult child, an adult grandchild that they needed, they wanted to talk to. So, so we got all that information ahead of time so that we could design that recruitment plan. But we're really not even putting a lot of effort into the recruitment plan. The last thing I'll say is that we, we need more uh, minorities who are clinical trialists. And there are some recent efforts to, um, to focus on that, to do that um, training and preparation, but it, it, really, it, it really needs to be an investment uh, so that we can, can increase the workforce there. Hi, Dr. Wilkins. I'm Ken Szymanski. I'm the Senior Vice Dean for Research in the college. And <clears throat> thanks very you, much. You're, taking, you're getting the names down for people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk and uh, even more for the discussion. Um, I work with the Lazarus Cancer Foundation and our focus is on getting, uh, enabling people to participate in cancer clinical trials, especially members of underserved uh, community, medically underserved communities, or I should say healthcare underserved communities. <clears throat> and you mentioned a couple of times during your talk and the discussion, the issue of financial toxicity. Mm -hmm. All of these chronic diseases, not just Alzheimer's of course, and particularly cancer, have devastating uh, effects on the finances of families, uh, even middle-class families, but certainly poorer families. Um, so we have reimbursed, and I'm using that word strongly, reimbursed, not paid, reimbursed patients to get to clinical trials uh, for um, travel, could be airfare, for a companion, uh, for lodging, um, not for lost wages, uh, not for childcare, but to uh, increase the level of participation of members of especially minority communities. And um, one of the big concerns about this, of course, is um, that we are, this is coercive and therefore inappropriate for under the um, you know, um, standard IRB review. And in fact, we've gotten the FDA uh, to issue a guidance letter saying it's not. We have legislation that has been passed in Pennsylvania, California, and other states saying it's not. And the real issue here is a foundation can't take care of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. To your point about the companies that will advertise a drug, which by the way, should never have been approved. Right. Um, <clears throat> and that, um, to advertise a drug after the fact, but not to recruit appropriately to the fact. And to Dr. McRae's point, uh, we also know that Alzheimer's is one of the uh, particular diseases of many where there are cultural issues about recruitment as well. Absolutely. That uh, play into that. Uh, in cancer, that's certainly true too. And uh, so um, we are now uh, putting pressure on companies to make this a systematic aspect of their clinical trials. Uh, and of course, one of the issues there is um, they'll tell you that they do it, but they don't do it. <laughs> they do it on a case by case basis. So well, um, I'm just yeah. adding that to this discussion. Well, thanks, so, so many great points there. I, I think the issue uh, around coercion is one that I hear from a lot of people in dealing with their IRBs. Um, some people just don't start with the, you know, the understanding that it costs to participate in a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. So, so, so that should be the starting point. Participating in a clinical trial means that you had to take time. You likely had to travel. You may have had to get childcare, you know, um, adult, you know, parent, you know, other caregiver care um, uh, responsibilities need to be shifted. It costs you to participate in a clinical trial. If it costs fifty dollars, a hundred dollars participate in a clinical trial. If you make more than a hundred thousand dollars a year, maybe that's you know negligible. But if you make 
$20,000 a year, $25,000 a year. You don't have that. So if, if, we, if we think that this is, is really um, something that, that should be down to volunteerism, that, oh, if you really wanted to participate, you could do it for free, then we're not recognizing the burden and the additional cost there. So, so I think we need a lot of education there. And I'm on the uh, on SACARP, the you know the Secretary's Advisory um, Committee on Human Research Protection. And these are things that we've talked about, which is you know how do we help um, IRBs understand these varying needs and risks um, that people are going to have because of their socioeconomic state. So glad glad to hear that you all are paying for um, travel and, and some other things. Thank you. Reimbursing. Reimbursing. <laughs> Sorry. One, Edit that from the tape. One last question <laughs> from the audience. Um, hi, my name is Mateen. I'm a second year. Um, I just want to say thank you, uh, firstly, for this uh, talk. It was, I appreciated the fact, I feel like a lot of, um, like our education sometimes is like talking about the social determinants of health, but I felt like actually applying something uh, was useful. Um, so my question is sort of part of, I feel like what I heard from your talk was the lack of accountability on a lot of institutions, schools, um, drug companies um, in addressing these things. And so I was just wondering for a lot of us are students in here, like besides waiting until we're now those people in power who can make those changes, like what advice do you have for us to sort of follow these footsteps and make the changes that need to be made? Thank you for the question. Um, and I, again, I met with a couple of groups of really incredible students here. So um, I know some of you are coming to take my job, so I'll be ready. Uh, but um, the one point that I think we miss is the policy piece and advocacy. Uh, I, I think we need to focus more on how to use your voices to advocate for policy change. Uh, sometimes we think about advocacy, students are just thinking about advocating for the individual person in front of them, but we really need to advocate for these, these broader changes, whether that's policy at the elected official level or policy at the IRB level or within the institution, um, because sometimes there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, a big issue, of course, is uh, as it relates to social determinants of health, is like who's paying for it? So if we screen for social terms of health and we refer to the, a community partner, but we're not sharing any dollars there, um, you know, we're just passing the burden off to already underfunded, under-resourced community organizations. Uh, so we need insurance reform, we need payment reform so that we're actually incentivizing to keep people healthy. So you know, if we're bundling to keep people healthy, then we might spend a little bit more time working with a community organization who's gonna get the filters changed in the child's home, so who keeps coming to the ER with asthma, um, because we recognize that, that is, those are dollars saved um, that, that benefit us. So I think a lot of reforms have to happen uh, and, and pushing for that policy, meeting with elected officials. I, I think we need to push for more of that uh, in our work. Thank you. I'd like to, at this point, invite Lynn to come up because we have the award ceremony. But in the meantime, again, thank you, Dr. Wilkins. A round of applause for. Thank you so much. Do I need to put my mask back on? Oh, I don't care. It is our enormous pleasure to present this to you for your incredible leadership and inspiring ability to create a village and engage people. And I hope everybody in this room leaves with the commitment to do the same thing and to follow your example. So this is the, if I can open it, <laughs> the, um, the medal oh, wow. for the Marion Spencer Fay Awards that has the names everybody. of all the honorees over all the years on the top of the box. Put it on. Put it on. Yeah. I don't want to. Wow. Oh my, this is so beautiful. And this is an honorarium to keep you going on your wonderful, wonderful journey. And again, with thanks to Ramesh Ragapathy, 
to Janine Barber and to you in particular for being here with us. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you.